Hello everyone. Today we are going to be um, reading through some documents um, and then answering some questions on them. So I wanted to read the documents together and then um, you can answer the questions. And ultimately, as we read through these documents, we're trying to answer the question, was the partition of India a good idea given the information that the people knew at the time? So you'll notice as we read these documents that Two of the documents um, were from before the partition of India, and then two of them are from after the partition. And it's a lot easier to look back on an event and say, oh, we shouldn't have done that because you know the consequences than it is to look at it before and say, no, this is a good idea, we should do this. So you're gonna get an opportunity to do that after we go through these documents. So the first one is just a timeline of events. So if you have a question about what's going on and when it's happening, refer back to this document. It says, by the end of World War I, 1919, Indian leaders began fighting for independence from Great Britain. At this time, two major ethnic populations existed in India, Hindus, who were the great majority, and Muslims, who were a minority. Many Hindus hoped that India would remain united once the British left, including Gandhi. But some Muslims, especially leader Muhammad Ali Jinnah, worried about being a minority. When the British finally left India in 1947, they divided the Indian subcontinent, creating an independent India and a new state called Pakistan for Muslims. They called this division the Partition Plan. So in the 1930s, that's when the idea for a separate homeland for Muslims is introduced. By 1935, Great Britain reforms policies to grant greater independence to Indians. Muslims worry that they will be permanently the minority in a fully independent India. So if you think of it like this, if after the British leave, the Indians are um, a democracy, if India becomes a democracy, the way democratic governments work is by voting. Well, if you have a group of people that's the minority and then a larger group that's the majority, when you're voting on different things, it's always majority rule. So the Muslims are concerned that no matter what happens from this point on, they're going to be the minority. They're never going to get a say in their own government. That's one of the reasons why they really push to have their own country. In 1940, Muslim leader Jenna calls for the establishment of Pakistan as a separate state for Indian Muslims. In 1944, Hindu leaders failed to convince Jenna to keep India unified. Gandhi is one of those guys too. He is really trying to convince Jenna that they should be a united country and it would be better for Indians as a whole if they are united. Um, in August 1946, Hindu and Muslims clashed in Calcutta over the formation of an interim government and approximately 5,000 people die. Um, in March of 1947, the British government sends Lewis Mountbatten to India to the Determine a plan for transferring power to Indians before June of 1948. Um, in June, on June 3rd, 1947, Mountbatten announces the partition plan and speeds up the transfer of power by 10 months. August 14th to the 15th, 1947, is the transfer of power. Indians gained their independence officially from Great Britain. And August 16th through the 17th, 1947, the decision for the partition boundaries is released and published. Right after that, there's a migration that occurs um, and violence due to the partition continues until the end of 1947. Approximately 15 million people migrated and between 300,000 and 1 million refugees lost their lives during this partition, which is um, part of that video clip that I posted yesterday. If you watched that video, that was the partition and the mass migration that occurs afterwards. Okay, so the, like I said, these first two documents are um, from before the partition. So document A is Muhammad Ali Jannah. This is a passage from a speech that Jannah gave. He's known as the founder of Pakistan. Jannah served as the president of the All India Muslim League from 1913 until Pakistan's independence on August 15, 1947. The speech became known as a two-nation speech and was delivered at the Muslim League's annual meeting in 1940. So keep in mind when it's written, 1940, and who the audience is. It's delivered to the Muslim League's annual meeting. So every year the Muslim League meets and this is the speech that he gives. 
He says, if the British government really wants to secure the peace and happiness of the people of this subcontinent, the only course open to us is to allow Hindus and Muslims separate homelands by dividing India into autonomous national states. It is extremely difficult to appreciate why our Hindu friends fail to understand the real nature of Islam and Hinduism. They are not religions in the strict sense of the word, but are in fact different and distinct social orders. It is a dream that the Hindus and Muslims could ever evolve a common nationality. This misconception of one Indian nation has gone far beyond the, li the limits and is the cause of most of our troubles and will lead, to in lead India to destruction if we fail to revise our notions in time. The Hindus and the Muslims belong to two different religious philosophies, social customs, and literature. They never, they neither intermarry nor interdine together, and indeed they belong to two different civilizations, which are based mainly on conflicting ideas and conceptions. To yoke together two such nations under a single state, one as a numerical minority and the other as a majority, must lead to a growing discontent and the final destruction of the government of such a state. Muslim India cannot accept any constitution that would lead to a Hindu majority government. The Muslims are a nation according to any definition of a nation, and they must have their homelands, their territory, and their state. We wish to live in peace and harmony with our neighbors as a free and independent people. Document B is written by Nehru. Um, this passage Below is an excerpt from the book, The Discovery of Ind India by Nehru, published in 1946. Nehru was India's first prime minister and a member of India's Congress during pre-independence. Nehru was actively involved in India's independence movement and he wrote the book between 1942 and 1947 when he was in prison for civil disobedience. So Nehru was one of Gandhi's um, friends, they worked hard together, they used civil disobedience to get the British to leave India. Um, and so when India does gain their independence, he becomes their first prime minister. Again, he was part of the Indian National Congress, so he's a Hindu, and he writes this before the partition. He says, any division of India on a religious basis as between Hindus and Muslims as proposed by the Muslim League today cannot separate the followers of these two principal religions of India for they are spread out all over the country. Even if the areas in which each group is in a majority are separated, huge minorities belonging to the other group remain in each area. Other religious groups like the Sikhs are split up unfairly against their will and placed in two different states. In giving freedom to separate to one group, another group is denied that freedom. If the economic aspects of separation are considered, it is clear that India as a whole is a strong and more or less self-sufficient economic unit. If the division is made so as to separate the predominantly Hindu and Muslim areas, the Hindu areas will not be so hard hit. The Muslim areas, on the other hand, will be economically backward. Thus, the odd fact emerges that those who today demand separation will suffer the most from it. The astonishing fact remains that those who propose Pakistan or partition have constantly, have consistently refused to define what they mean or to consider the implications of such a division. They move on an emotional plane only. It is difficult to imagine any free state emerging from such turmoil. And if something does emerge, it will be full of contradictions and insoluble problems. So when he's talking about them making this decision on an emotional plane. He's saying that the Muslims are only thinking emotionally. They're not thinking practically. And he's making the argument that this isn't economically going to be a good decision for the Muslims to have their own state of Pakistan. Okay, so again, those two documents are written before the partition. So you are going to be answering questions about each of those documents. So there's questions here about the timeline, those first three questions. There's two questions about document A and a few questions about document B. And then I want you to answer this question. Both Jenna and Nehru were writing before Great Britain has granted India independence. In other words, the argument over whether India should be split is occurring against the backdrop of the fight for Indian independence. How might this context 
have affected what Jenna and Nehru are saying in these documents. So that's asking how might the fact that they hadn't yet gained independence, how is that affecting this conversation? Okay. Documents C and D are written after the partition of India. So document C is written by Lord Lewis um, Mountbatten. So the excerpt below is from an interview with Lord Lewis Mountbatten, the last British leader of India. The interview was recorded over 20 years after the partition of India. The excerpt express presents um, Mountbatten's views on Muhammad Ali Jannah, who died somewhat suddenly of tuberculosis on September 11th, 1948. So he's had 20 years now to reflect on the decision and his part in the decision. And this is what he has to say. You see, Jenna was so much of a one man band. If someone had told me he's going to be dead in a few months, a few months, would I then I'm asking myself this question now, would I have said, let's hold India together and not divide it? Most probably Jenna was a lunatic. He was absolutely completely impossible. I don't think we could have waited for him to die because I don't think we neither could have afforded the time nor could we have felt certain of it. But what we could have done is to argue with him in a very different way. I assumed I was dealing with a man who was there for keeps and he has and he had Pakistan as his object on which I couldn't steer him around. If in fact we suppose for a moment that Jenna had died Literally, before the transfer of power, I believe the Indian Congress would have been so relieved that their arch enemy was dead. We would have been dealing on a basis where Congress would have been prepared to give up much more and the other Muslim leaders would have been ready to accept it. It's a horrifying thought that we were never told. Anyway, that I wasn't told that Jenna was dying was almost criminal. The only chance, and I'm saying this now in the spur of the moment, it was the only chance we had of keeping some form of unified India because he was the only, I repeat, the only stumbling block. The others were not so obdurant. I'm sure the Congress would have found some compromise with him. So when he's looking back in it 20 years later, he is blaming the partition of India solely on one person. All right, and document D is written by Stanley Wolpert. He is an American historian specializing in Indian history. The following excerpt is from the introduction of Wolpert's book, Shameful Flight, The Last Years of the British Empire in India, published in 2006, in which he expresses his views on, the in, on India's partition. Wolpert had made several trips to India. So this is an excerpt from an American historian Again, look at the date. It's published in 2006. So this is after the partition and he is reflecting on it. In mid-August of 1947, the world's mightiest modern empire, Great Britain, abandoned its vow to protect one fifth of humankind. Prime Minister Clement Attlee and his cabinet gave Mountbatten until June of 1948 to try to facilitate an agreement between the major competing political party leaders of India to work together within a single federation. But adrenaline-charged Mountbatten scuttled that last best hope of the British Imperial Raj to leave India a single independent government, deciding instead to divide British India into fragmented dominions of India and Pakistan. The hastily and ineptly drawn lines of partition of North India's two greatest providence, Punjab and Bengal, slash through their multicultural heartlands. The tragedy of partition and its more than half century legacy of hatred, fear, and communal conflict might well have been avoided or at least mitigated, but for the arrogance and ignorance of a handful of British and Indian leaders. Those 10 additional months of post-war talks aborted by an impatient Mountbatten might have helped all parties to agree that cooperation was much wiser than conflict dialogue more sensible than division, words easier to cope with and pay for than perpetual warfare. So he's arguing that Mountbatten hurried the process and by doing so created um, a lifelong conflict between these two countries that they could never come back from. Okay, 
So now that we've taken a look at those two documents, I want you to read these questions. There's some about document C and a few about document D. And then the last thing I want you to do is answer this question. Was India's partition plan a good decision given what people knew at the time? So I want you to use evidence from the document to support your answer and please cite the documents that you used. Your response should be at least five sentences. So you're thinking, was it a good decision based on what people knew at the time? Um, and that's what you're going to be doing today.